and let's get started. So welcome everyone. My name is Suzanne Bontempo and I'm the program manager for Our Water, Our World. Our Water, Our World is a program that's designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality. It is a education resource and we are uh, hosted in partnership today with the Russian River Watershed. Julie is my wonderful colleague who's assisting me today and we'll be addressing any of the questions that you might have in the Q&A so please feel free to uh, type away, use the Q&A to communicate any comments or questions and then throughout the program we'll have a couple uh, moments to pause to address any questions that came up. So without further ado, let's get started. So today we're going to go through the slides for about an hour. I did mention I'll be pausing a couple of times to address uh, some questions. And then I will leave a solid hour and a half, I'm sorry, a solid 30 minutes afterwards to continue with the Q&A. If there's any questions that I didn't get to during those pauses, or if there's more questions that have come up throughout our time together. And what we're going to learn are the principles of how um, to garden less toxically. We're gonna work, we're gonna learn why working with an integrated pest management or IPM approach means less pest problems. And then how your garden is a dynamic ecosystem. And we're not limiting it to just the garden. We are going to also uh, talk about uh, pest prevention around the home as well. So um, keeping your home uh, and garden happy and healthy throughout the fall and winter season. How do we accomplish this? We maintain a healthy garden. We adjust the irrigation schedule for shorter days. We prevent common pest problems from occurring. And we are going to talk about management tips for ants, rats, rodents, raccoons, and snails, and any other uh, pest problems that you might like to learn about. So the Our Water, Our World program uh, is an award-winning program. You might recognize some of these uh, materials in your local garden center or hardware store or home improvement. You can also get uh, access to these materials on the Our Water, Our World website. It is an integrated pest management educational program for the public. It is geared to uh, offering you the consumer support about how we solve our pest problems with a less toxic approach and how we navigate that pesticide aisle. So that's always uh, can be a little daunting. The photo on the left is a, a rack that has a list of uh, we call these fact sheets and they are by pest topics such as ants, aphids, rats and mice, uh, lawns, yellow jackets. And you can find these on the website, which you'll, I'll uh, show you in a minute. So integrated pest management is a decision-making process. It helps us look at the system as a whole to identify what, uh, what the problem really is. Oftentimes what we see are symptoms of a problem and not necessarily the problem itself. Uh, it invites us to get a little bit more curious and to dive in a little deeper uh, for proper pest identification. And then once we can identify that pest problem, we want to decide, is it something that we can live with or is it something that we need to take action immediately? Um, and if we do need to take some action, there's a, uh, a couple, a handful of different action strategies we would take, which we'll be discussing today, which would be cultural controls, mechanical controls, biological controls, and then the chemical controls, which are the pesticides we would be um, reaching for as the last resort and always the less to toxic option available. So I like to share this illustration of integrated pest management. It resonates with me pretty well, a kind of uh, how we go about um, managing pests around a home and garden. We're going to first identify what the problem is. You know, we're always going to be monitoring. We're going to be walking around our garden. We're going to be in our house kind of, you know, noticing when those ants first start to come in. 
And then we're going to evaluate the problem and see if it's, uh, you know, is, is it severe enough? Do we need to take action or is it a very mild situation or do we know that the problem is going to go away within, um, you know, a couple of days or a week or so? Uh, we can uh, work with preventative means, which preventative prevention is the foundation of uh, any type of pest management program. And then we take some action when the uh, thresholds have been met, and then we monitor from there and identify if that action worked or if the problem comes back. So as I mentioned, prevention is the foundation to pest management. And I'd like to ask, what does prevention look like to you? Uh, what kind of tools can uh, be implemented for prevention? Um, and then also the timing of the management action. Uh, we want to make sure that the pest is uh, present when we do take some action and understand a pest can be um, a plant, like a weed or an insect or a disease you know, things like that. Um, and then understand that even watering or fertilizing, overwatering, underwatering, uh, over fertilizing with synthetic fertilizers can also uh, create problems. So we would want to adjust our irrigation systems to water uh, appropriately and fertilize uh, with organic fertilizers to reduce pest problems. And then sanitation, cleaning up the garden. So these are gonna be some key things. So before we go any further, I'm going to throw up a poll here. I'm placing a poll in front of your screen, if you don't mind. I'm going to test your knowledge. We're gonna take a minute just to fill out these three questions. It really should just take all but a moment. If you don't mind uh, answering, number one, is it more effective to treat an ant infestation with a bait station rather than a spray? You can answer yes or no. And then number two, when is the best time of the year to add new plants to your garden, specifically perennials, trees, and shrubs? You can go ahead and answer. If it's spring, summer, autumn or winter. And then lastly, if you do need to use a pesticide, and of course, always the eco-friendly, when is the best time of year to apply it? When is the best time of year? When is the best time of the day to apply it? Would it be early in the morning, the end of the day, or any time is fine? So go ahead and answer those questions. I'll give you all another 10 seconds. Oh, wait, I didn't launch it yet. Okay. Now I'm launched the poll. Boy, I must be a little sleepy. So, more effective to treat an ant infestation with a bait station rather than a spray. When's the best time of year to plant your perennials, trees, and shrubs? And then if you need to use a pesticide, when is the best time to apply it? We'll give you all about 15 more seconds. And awesome. Okay, well done. We are going to come back to these questions in a bit. And I will share that everyone got number one correct. So everyone got number one correct. It is more effective to treat an uh, ant infestation with a bait station rather than a spray. And then number two and three, we are going to learn in a little bit. Okay, thank you for uh, indulging me with that. So let's continue. So uh, as I mentioned, proper pest identification is key. If we can't identify the pest, then we're gonna have a really hard time trying to manage it. Uh, we also want to understand that life cycle of that pest. So uh, for instance, once the rains start, we know the weeds come. Um, so being prepared for that, doing some uh, management practices that might prevent weeds from um, taking over certain sections of our garden. 
Uh, also, uh, you know, understanding the pest habitat and the timing of that pest. So for instance, I always like to talk about the spittle bugs that come early in um, like uh, beginning of April and they look like someone just spit on your plants. Well, those literally are around just for one to two weeks. So typically just blasting them off with water is all we need to do. And really uh, understanding that that threshold that they will go away on their own is uh, pretty right on. Also understanding, are there any natural enemies in the area? Do we have beneficial insects that are keeping the balance and um, uh, consuming the bad pests that we might see in the garden, uh, knowing that 90% of the bugs we actually see in the garden are beneficial insects. So if we do have beneficial insects present, we wanna make sure we let them take care of the problem for us. So a couple resources, as I mentioned, that'll be really, really helpful to you is the ourwaterourworld.org website. This is going to give us those fact sheets. It's going to give us a list of uh, less toxic products that we could find in our local retailers. It also has this really fantastic feature called Ask the Expert, which will um, is available for you to use. You'll you uh, click on that and it opens up to an um, email format and you'll type in your question, you'll get an answer within 24 hours, Monday through Friday. It's a wonderful resource. And then of course, uh, the UCIPM uh, website. And for those of you, well, um, Arizona, you're kind of arid, a little bit drier, but uh, California, we are in a, a specifically a Mediterranean climate. So the reason why I'm a huge advocate for all of us Californians to uh, do our online research um, and limit it to just the UCIPM website is because we have a summer dry climate and uh, the research on pest problem solving that UC uh, IPM offers is specific to our Mediterranean climate. So did you know that when you increase the health of your garden, you're reducing pest problems? Isn't that remarkable? So it's that simple to reduce pest problems. And we do that by continuing to keep our soil and plants healthy. We do that by um, adding compost to the soil. Uh, we're going to amend that soil when we're planting new plants. We can do top dressings around fruit trees and around perennials of uh, compost before the rainy season is always nice. Uh, when we uh, add compost to the soil, we're increasing the health of the soil and the health of the plants. And we're also increasing the water holding capacity. So uh, Donna and Red Bluff, you know, every time you plant a plant, it's so important for you to make sure you're amending that soil the best you can. And also taking advantage of laying mulch over your uh, soil beds, around your planting beds, uh, and then lying compost on top of those planting beds with mulch on top of it. Boy, having a challenging time, I guess. I apologize. And then um, the reason why is because good quality compost is loaded with beneficial bacteria and beneficial fungi. And these are going to be really important components to uh, increasing the health of our soil and increasing uh, good healthy soil structure. And the bacteria and the fungi are actually nutrient transport enhancement systems that really help to break down organic matter, uh, store nutrients in the soil, break down toxins and pollutants, and hold that soil together. So it's a win-win no matter what type of soil you have, no matter what the uh, uh, structure is, we're going to use mulch to improve that soil. And then we're going to work with organic fertilizers. And the reason why um, organic fertilizers are so important is that they actually are feeding the plants at a more natural rate. Uh, it's not going, these organic fertilizers are not going to leach or run off and get in our local waterways. Uh, what these organic fertilizers do is um, they allow that plant to, um, the fertilizers feed the soil, feed the microbiology in the soil, which in turn feed the root systems to our plants. Understand that synthetic fertilizers are really high in salts and that they actually act like steroids for our plants, stimulating a lot of new growth. 
And what we see is when we have a lot of uh, new growth that's constantly being stimulated uh, on our plants, well, that new growth is tender and filled with these plant sugars. And guess who likes tender, sugary, juicy, new plant growth? many of the pest insects. There are no ding-dongs. They know that they can get a really nice meal when uh, we are fertilizing with a lot of synthetic fertilizers. So when we switch to organics, we actually see a huge reduction in pest problems because, because of that. We also want to take advantage of mulch, um, especially as we move into the rainy season. Um, we are going to uh, put mulch all around our garden at a rate of two to four inches whenever possible. The only thing is we want to make sure that the mulch is not around the crown of the plant. So wherever that uh, stems or the trunk of the plant and the root system meet, we want to make sure that area just a few inches out is clear. We don't, we always want it to be clear of uh, leaf debris um, and mulch. We always want that to have some nice airflow for the plant. As uh, mulch breaks down, it adds food to the soil. It also is going to protect the soil, keeping it cool in the summer, warm in the winter. It's going to prevent erosion. Um, it's also going to reduce water evaporation rates significantly. And uh, we're going to, when we work with a uh, chunky mulch, as seen here in this picture on the left, uh, it actually creates habitat for beneficial insects. A lot of our beneficial insects that overwinter really like that chunkier mulch. And for those of you that did not answer autumn, I will share that fall is the best time to plant plants, the best time to add plants to our garden. We want to take advantage of the fall season. And the main reason why is we are moving into shorter daylight hours, we are moving into cooler temperatures, and we are moving towards a rainy season. By next spring into summer, when the heat really starts to come on, these plants have had this entire time to become established and to uh, uh, develop healthy root systems and then really be prepared for the next big warm summer uh, season. And so we might ask which plants are best for my garden? Well, here in California, we're going to choose California natives and, Calif um, and Mediterranean perennials. Here we're going to choose California natives and Mediterranean native plants that uh, adapt easily to our climate. Something I do want to share, though, is that not all native plants are going to be uh, low water use. Some are going to be a little bit moderate to high, such as redwood trees. Uh, they do require more water. So just understand when we are introducing uh, California natives to our garden and different Mediterranean native plants to our gardens, we wanna be aware of what the water requirements are for that plant. We also want to match the plant to the conditions of our garden uh, so that they can adapt well to what our garden has to offer. So what I mean by that is the sun exposure. Uh, if we have full sun in this one area of the garden, we want to make sure we're planting full sun plants, so plants that can handle that full sun all day long. If we've got a section of the garden that's morning sun, afternoon shade, we really want to uh, uh, follow uh, and plant plants that can adapt to that sun exposure. We also want to make sure we're planting plants that are going to grow into the space we have. So if we have a space that's three feet by three feet, we're going to make sure we plant a plant that is not going to get any larger than three feet by three feet at maturity. So uh, we want plants to grow into the size and shape that our garden has to offer. And then we uh, have the opportunity to choose pest and disease resistant varieties, which is very helpful nowadays. Plants for the water, for the Russian River watershed climate are going to include our, our Russian River friendly plants. You can find a list of Russian River fr friendly plants on the Russian River watershed.org website. Uh, as well as 
um, the Water Smart Plant Program, which is the Water the Saving Water Partnership website. There's an amazing catalog of plants uh, that are going to adapt perfectly for our climate here. And uh, something else that's really cool that the uh, Water Saving Partnership website offers is plant design templates. So uh, this was, uh, they're all um, designed after the fires in Santa Rosa that we saw, what, three years ago. Uh, so these are with the intention of uh, reducing water. Uh, so water-wise plant designs, as well as uh, fire-wise plant designs. So check that out. They're amazing templates. So go check out that website and you'll see them there. And then also you can always reach out to your local uh, master gardener, the county master gardeners where you live. There's always going to be a nice list of plants uh, that are going to be adaptable to our climate, as well as our California Native Plant Society. And when we plant plants, we want to group them together into hydrozones. So grouping plants with similar irrigation needs and also similar microclimate needs. So again, we're looking at plants that are going to share the same sun exposure, the same shade exposure, wind, heat, and then of course, with similar water needs. We wanna make sure we're always planting plants with similar water needs together so that when we are watering them, um, they are all going to be happy within that zone. Hopefully we are uh, all have some type of drip irrigation system set up. However, if you don't, if you do not have a drip irrigation system, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, however, since most of us have a tendency to have some type of drip system, I'd like to share that uh, most of the municipalities right now are offering rebates for a smart controller, which is an amazing deal. So if you're looking to upgrade your controller to a smart controller, look at your local municipality for a rebate to do so because the uh, rebates, it's an amazing savings that you get. The reason why drip irrigations are uh, superior and uh, more desirable than hand watering is because the drip irrigation systems allow for a more efficient and localized deep watering. Uh, we're losing less water. We have a tendency to see less uh, runoff or areas that maybe did not need to get watered with uh, specifically with drip systems. We have direct contact with the soil, so there's less water evaporation rate, uh, water, less water evaporation loss. And then we could set the timer for early in the morning when the air is cool and that the soil is cool. So it's the best time to water. It's really between that 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. time is going to be the best time to have your irrigation systems watering your garden. And then we can also set the uh, clocks for multiple start times. So for those of you that have really heavy clay or really rocky crummy soil where the water just isn't absorbing into that soil, you can set the start times multiple times so that we can still get the volume of water that the plants need out, but it's gonna be stretched over a period of time. This is called a cycle and soak. And you can get some more information on setting uh, irrigation schedules uh, for your uh, controllers at the watersavingpartnership.org. When we water, we want to encourage deep root systems. Not always easy if we've got hard packed uh, clay soils. However, we can still encourage deep root systems. And the way we do that is by over time watering more uh, deeper and wider. So when we first plant a plant, that root ball is just gonna be the size of the pot that it came in. So over time, and it could take, um, two years, uh, one, well, one to two years for perennials to become established. And it could take up to five years for trees to become established and shrubs are going to be right in between. So during that time, as these plants are becoming established, we want to uh, slowly uh, offer more water less often. So we're going to be watering deeper over time, less frequent. 
to encourage nice deep root systems. And this is an aerial illustration of what I'm talking about. So uh, I thought that this was a really nice way to see that um, when we're watering, we're going to focus the water around the drip line of our plants to really encourage the uh, root systems to grow out. But also we wanna focus the water on those little root hairs. We really want to avoid watering at the crown, right where the trunk and the roots of that plant meet or the stems and the roots of that plant. We want to avoid focusing the water there because over time we can really invite different types of crown rot, which would be detrimental to our plants. So over as the plants mature, we want to make sure we drink, bring our drip emitters out and add more emitters so that we're getting nice, full, even coverage all the way around the plant. And even though this illustration is a tree, it's going to be the same com concept for perennials and shrubs. Whenever possible, it's really nice to capture as much water uh, on site. Again, the uh, municipalities are very generous this time of year and offer a lot of rebates for rainwater harvesting. So check out the websites for that as well, your local municipality, water district. So something I just love talking about is that with one single rain event that might uh, give us an inch of rain, an inch of rain over a thousand square foot surface, such as your roof, can capture over 600 gallons of water. So that's significant. That's just one rain event that will give us possibly an inch of water. Uh, can We can capture over 600 gallons. So whenever possible, it's really nice to uh, add uh, different types of rain catchment systems to our properties. Uh, of course, the rain barrel on the left is just really your average 50 to 55 gallon rain barrel. Uh, the one on the upper right is actually a cistern. They're building them now, which are these nice linear designs, which work perfect for going along the side of a house, taking up less space, but being very, very effective. So look into that if, you're, uh, if your property allows. And so here's just a little shout out for those rebates I was talking uh, about. You want to uh, reach out to your water efficient landscape rebate program for your city. Each city has their uh, different kind of combo platter of rebates that they offer anywhere from irrigation efficiency, rainwater harvesting, the gray water laundry to landscape and turf conversion. So check that out. With that, I'd like to ask if there's any questions I could answer this moment. The ones on the Q&A, it looks like you're handling them as we go through, but I'll keep an eye on them and make sure. Okay, I haven't um, popped over there lately. Oh, Carl has a question. Is it a good idea to stick plastic pipes vertically into the soil near thirsty plants so you can water into them? In general, I'm not a super fan of that because as you mentioned, plants where they need to be watered keep changing as they increase their canopy size. So you have to keep reinserting new pipes as the plant grows. Yeah, and unless those... Um pipes. See, we really want to also understand the root zone. Uh, how deep is that root zone of that plant going to get? Uh, make sure that pipe is perforated. And then, as I mentioned, as the plant grows, we want to make sure that we're really, as Julie just said, making sure we have even water all the way around. So um, it is best just to water as the plants um, as the plants grow and mature, it's better just to kind of coax those root systems out and down. And it's not so easy to um, uh, set those pipes up early on because, you know, unless the root system, it'll be hard for those root systems to mature appropriately um, because they will be growing over time. So. Another thing that's interesting about the pipes is that they still depend on a measured output of 
of water. So you still need to use a drip system with them. You don't just fill it with a hose and walk away. That won't saturate the area to the distance that you're hoping. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay, awesome. Well, let's keep moving forward. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about maintenance around our garden and how this maintenance is actually going to increase the health of our garden and reduce pest problems. So this time of year, uh, we'll see, you know, some of our uh, perennials are past season. Uh, so we want to deadhead them, cut back uh, the appropriate varieties of perennials that require getting cut back. We want to uh, kind of uh, do a little survey of our property. Are there any uh, larger shrubs or trees that have like a dead limb or damaged branches? We want to remove those. We certainly want to remove any limbs that might cause uh, uh, possible structural damage to like a fence or a house. And if it is a little bit uh, too large for us to handle. We certainly want to hire one of our local arborists to come in and take care of that for us. The key is, is that as we move into a winter season uh, and when we have these storm events, uh, any dead or damaged branch can come down. Uh, something else I like to share is um, we sometimes see these branches that are called whips. They're just like, we have the canopy and there's just a couple, like one or two, just really long skinny uh, branches. We call those whips. We see that happen on roses. We see it happen with our fruit trees on occasion. And if that's the case, it's a good idea just to trim those whips back until the dormant season when we go ahead and do our annual fruit tree pruning or our annual rose pruning. And then of course we want to remove any of this dead, damaged, or diseased material and get it off site whenever possible. We also want to clean up the garden. Sanitation is key to preventing pest problems, or I should say at least reducing pest problems. So here uh, in uh, California, we're at the end of our apple season. Uh, and so it's really important to clean up any fallen fruit that's on the ground. And let's go ahead and clean off those trees to get any of those, uh, what we call mummies, the overripe apples that have just stayed on the tree uh, for the duration of the season. We want to get those also into a closed secure compost system or offsite. Uh, and the main reason is because uh, these uh, fruits that are still on our trees are going to uh, be nice places for certain insects to overwinter, such as codling moth, woolly apple aphid. Um, of course, it's going to attract uh, other flies and yellow jackets as it starts to rot. And then um, as it starts to well, ripen and the fruit that's on the ground is going to be an invitation for our urban critters, such as the rats, field mice, uh, raccoons, possums, deer. So when we can clean up our gardens, we're going to, um, you know, uh, not invite these other critters. Um, also, you know, at the end of the season, those zucchinis that got away from us that are just now supersized, I call them the sneakers. These are uh, also invitations for rodents to come and nibble, as you can see in this picture here. And then of course, any diseased leaves. So those of you that have uh, experienced peach leaf curl, uh, of course, that's more of a spring uh, pest that we see. But you know, as those peach, uh, as those diseased leaves develop and they fall, it's important to remove them from the site. You want to either pick them up off the ground or pluck them off the tree and get them off site. And if you are interested in uh, developing your fruit tree garden, and it's not limited to just fruit trees, we are moving towards the winter and we're right around the corner from bare root uh, season. And the bare root season includes roses, fruit trees, berries, 
some perennials, some vines and such. So you can uh, check in with your local garden center to see if they have a catalog of the bare root plants they're going to be bringing in for purchase. And this starts around uh, January and goes into February. Um, and then once we move into the dormant season, it's an excellent time to prune, do all of our really heavy pruning for our fruit trees, for our roses, and so forth. So there's an awesome book that's been in my library for many, many years called How to Prune Fruit Trees. I encourage you to check that out. It is a book that um, just about every professional friend I have has had in their arsenal for a very long time. And then if you'd like some more information on kind of uh, backyard fruit tree culture, please check out the Dave Wilson website. There are some wonderful videos on uh, how to prune fruit trees, how to uh, grow fruit trees in our urban gardens. So as we move inside the house, we want to prepare a house to prevent pests from coming in. And some of the tools we use is, it's a perfect time of year to put up new weather stripping. Uh, it's also going to keep the heat in, right, and the cool air out, but it also keeps insects out. Uh, fresh feet of caulk around the window frames, around cupboards and cabinets will also prevent crawling insects from moving in. And then uh, putting up, uh, blocking any points of entry uh, with quarter inch hardware cloth for our rodents. So what we see here is this is the quarter inch hardware cloth that is actually behind a uh, attic vent. So they understand the attic vent or the foundation vents, those rodents can slip through that vent cover. But when we have this quarter inch hardware cloth behind, which is a galvanized wire mesh, they cannot enter. Other barriers that we want to work with around the garden would be like bird netting, row cover, deer fencing, uh, gopher baskets, and so forth. So when we talk about pest prevention, regardless if it's indoors or out, one of my main goes go-tos is creating barriers. How can I prevent them from getting to my food or prevent them from getting into my compost or prevent them from getting into my house? A very popular uh, a barrier that I talk about often are exclusion frames and exclusion baskets. And this is uh, the main um, uh, tool that I talk about when, we're, when we have specifically rats in the garden. So people ask me on a regular basis, they say, I've got rats eating my tomatoes. How can I prevent that from happening? Well, we actually have to build some type of a fence around that vegetable garden or some type of an exclusion basket over those raised beds. I know it might sound a little overwhelming and daunting and you might say, hey, my tomatoes are taller than me right now. Well, if that's the case, we can use these exclusion baskets, make them as tall or as short as you'd like. And then when the plant gets to be a certain height, we can spe specifically tomatoes, we can then prune the bottom 18 inches of that plant to two feet up. There's no fruit down there anyway. The fruit's all a little higher. And now we have uh, this exposed area that uh, is, is less inviting to our rodents. Um, something that I think is really fun is this picture on the left, a friend of mine, she had a bird feeder with this squirrel baffle over it. Well, the bird feeder broke, but she kept the baffle and put it over a potted plant to prevent the squirrels from getting in. So depending on what the critter is that you're trying to exclude would dictate the size of the fencing or the size, uh, the gauge of the hole of the, um, of the cover. So that's just something to keep in mind. So with rodents, we're gonna use a quarter inch hardware cloth uh, with squirrels, we could use poultry wire or, you know, one by one inch, not an issue. That's just fine. If we're going to uh, line raised beds with a gopher wire, we'd be working with half inch hardware cloth. So these are all the different uh, size uh, gauges that we would need to use. And then some tools that we would uh, work with to prevent weeds are going to be an assortment of different weeding to tools such as a hula ho, a weed whack, or a lawnmower, and most importantly, sheet mulching. So 
specifically sheet mulching is awesome if you have crummy hard clay soil if that's hard packed clay soil that just doesn't the water just doesn't move through i invite you to sheet mulch a section of your garden that is the hardest uh most challenging section to plant in and if you sheet mulch by laying out multiple layers of cardboard overlapping the edges making sure that six inches of overlap on each you know each flap and then putting no less than four inches of mulch or a combination of compost and then mulch making sure that we are at that four inch uh you know height that thickness over time as that uh cardboard decomposes and as the microbiology becomes alive and decomposes uh, the material, that soil becomes really nice and uh, workable. So it is a nice way to help in improve the structure of your soil. And then of course, if you're doing a lawn conversion, you can just put the cardboard right on top of the lawn. And then with the same practice of that, no less than four inches and over time, that lawn is going to decompose and become food for your soil. So it's really wonderful to take advantage of sheet mulching, especially before the rainy season. And then traps. Traps is another uh, big uh, category that I employ whenever possible. And there's a number of different types of traps that we might consider or might not even consider. So like sticky traps, uh, these are going to be wonderful ways to monitor when pest problems are at a certain, certain threshold. Oftentimes we use the sticky traps uh, to help us see when seasonal pests are, uh, are around, have joined our garden. A lot of times the pests are not easy for us just to see when we're doing our normal monitoring or inspecting on our plants. So uh, hanging sticky traps around those zones helps us identify when the thrips might be active or when the diabroticas are at their a threshold where we have to take some action and so forth. Uh, putting out yellow jacket traps very, very early, that nice warm, first nice warm weekend in March is the ideal time because the queens, which look like supersized yellow jackets are the only ones that overwinter. The rest of the colony uh, will, uh, come to its demise and the queen will overwinter and hibernate. And then it's that nice warm uh, temperatures that we see in March where she'll be buzzing around looking for a new place to develop and build her nest. If we can capture her, we've reduced thousands of yellow jackets from our property. So that's why it's so wonderful to get these yellow jacket traps out early. And then of course, there's a, a whole assortment of gopher traps, mole traps, uh, rat and mouse traps and so forth. And then of course, slug and snail traps. In addition to working with tools and barriers and traps, we also want to invite the beneficial insects. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, we will see uh, well, 90, over 90% 90 of the bugs in our garden are actually good bugs eating bad bugs. So, but we don't always recognize them. So I, it's been, um, I've had a lot of stories where people told me that this soldier beetle was just all over their plum tree in the early spring or all over their apple tree in the early spring. And so they thought it was a pest and they just knocked it back with some neem and wow, that was it. So I have to, uh, I love in the spring talking to folks about um, being on the search for your beneficial insects in the garden, what they look like. And oftentimes uh, we don't always recognize them. We want to attract them by planting a, a, a diversity of flowering plants and primarily plants with small flowers. And the reason why we want to uh, plant small flowers is because many of our beneficial insects are small. So small flowers include anything that looks like a daisy or a sunflower and understand that single flower like this daisy here, those white petals, those are actually rays. And what the flowers are is that yellow button in the center, that's actually hundreds of little flowers, okay? And then at the bottom is the yarrow. And sometimes the yarrow just looks like one cluster of flowers. And when we look closer, it's 
clusters of little tiny flowers, again, with those rays and with a little button center. So those flowers are even tinier. Understand that most of the plants that we, uh, what, well, that these plants that are listed here, as well as other plants that look like daisies or sunflowers or have tiny clusters, are going to offer nectar sources, uh, oftentimes for the adult version of that insect. Because many times it's the adult that is going for the pollen or the nectar, where it's the larval form of that insect that's going for the protein meal. Now, um, in the case of our ladybug, the ladybugs also will eat the protein meal, but will, in addition to that, enjoy the nectar of flowers, whereas the larva is strictly only eating the other bugs. And that goes with our hoverfly, that goes for our lacewing larva, um, and so forth. So when we're attracting beneficial insects, we want to be mindful to reduce pesticides. And even though we might be using organic pesticides or eco-friendly pesticides, realize that even the eco-friendlies they're not risk-free just because we're using insecticidal soap or neem. These are actually also going to cause harm to our beneficials if present. So a couple things to keep in mind when we use pesticides is one, we're always going to use them as a last resort. We're always going to choose toxic and eco, less toxic and eco-friendly. We're going to apply these pesticides uh, by uh, according to the label and something to keep in mind if that pest that we're trying to manage is not on the label, that product is not going to work for that pest. So this is something that's really, really important. We always want to wear PPE. I know we're familiar with this term now, but when we are spraying pesticides, we always want to make sure we're spraying uh, when there's nothing more than a five mile an hour breeze. So really when the air is still because of drift. And if there is a little, uh, you know, two mile an hour breeze, that pesticide can drift onto our skin and it could cause a problem. Even the eco-friendlies can. So we wanna make sure we're wearing long sleeves, wearing pants, we're wearing a mask, goggles, non-cotton gloves, uh, you know, covering ourselves the best we can. Um, you know, we don't need to wear a Tyvek suit, but we just wanna take some caution. And then it's an excellent time to, uh, we're moving towards November and December where we, it's a great time to uh, take advantage of the dormant season. So if we do have a lot of plants on our property, such as roses, fruit trees, um, other things that go dormant that have a tendency to get pest problems throughout the year, this is an excellent time to uh, work with dormant sprays. Dormant sprays are gonna be horticultural oil for insects and some type of a copper fungicide for diseases and apply them again according to the UCIPM website or according to the labels instructions. So tips for using products. Um, understand that when we work with eco-friendly products, sometimes they might take a little longer to work. So when we talk about those ant bait stations, as you know, they are more effective, but it could take about four days before we see those ants finally disappear, right? So it could take a little longer. Uh, timing is important, as I mentioned before. If that pest is not present, then there's no need to uh, use a pesticide. We always wanna make sure we're applying the pesticides when the pest we're trying to manage is present. We want to spot treat. We're not just going to spray the entire garden down. Uh, so a lot of times what happens is we see aphids on our rows and we're freaked out that those aphids are gonna get over on our kale and on our chard. Well, guess what? The aphids that are on the rows only enjoy the sugars from that rose and the aphids that are on the kale only enjoy the sugars that are on that kale and you'll notice they're different colors. So it doesn't, uh, again, we're just wasting time and money and product when we're doing broad spectrum sprays when we just want to target what we're trying to manage. We always apply pesticides at the end of the day at dusk when our pollinators are back in their colonies and when beneficial insects are less likely to be active. We can try to spray really early in the morning, but what I found is our pollinators are up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at sunrise right when um, the sun is up. And if that pesticide hasn't had enough time to dry, understand eco-pesticides 
are going to uh, not have residuals. They will not have any residuals that will impact our beneficial insects, our pets, our children, ourselves once dry, once they are dry on that plant. So when we spray at dusk, it has the entire night into the morning to dry. And then once that product is dry, beneficial insects can come and visit that plant. Our children can go and touch those leaves. Our plants, our pets can walk around those plants and the residuals are not going to be harmful. So that's why it's so important to plant, uh, to apply pesticides at dust. So for those of you that got that question right, yay. Um, if we do apply beneficial insects, like we've purchased that little container of ladybugs at the, uh, at the local garden center, then give them a little bit of time to, uh, you know, navigate the garden and to take care of all the pests that are there. And if some fly away, just know that they're looking for more food. So it's okay. It's okay. So uh, one uh, thing I just love to share, I can't help it now that we're in, um, we're living among uh, fires and floods in our local California landscapes. Uh, what do we do if we have pesticides that we no longer want? We're going to take them to our local household hazardous waste facility. It's free. It's easy. And for Sonoma County, it's going to be in Petaluma. It's uh, on Meacham Road. However, if you're in the north part of Sonoma County, uh, and if you're in Mendocino, you can look uh, and see where the mobile household hazardous waste drop off events are going to occur because they do have mobile events that rotate around um, the area in the um, North Sonoma County and into Mendocino County. All right. So I was wondering if there's any questions, but we're just about to get into some pest problem solving. So we can either just, um, well, I can answer a question if one's come up or we could just jump to the end. Well, there are two main questions still. One is about snails and slugs, which you'll be getting to shortly. Mm -hmm. And then if you could just spend a moment defining how to amend heavily clay soil to make it behave, what ratios are you looking for? So the ratios, um, it is gonna take time, but every time you add amendment, you're going to be increasing the health of that soil and improving the structure of that soil. So if it is a new landscape, um, we're going to work in uh, three to four inches of compost on top, and we're going to turn that in. Moving forward, and then we're going to plant our plants. We're going to add organic fertilizer at time of planting. We're going to mulch the top of that soil. Keeping that soil covered with mulch is key. It's going to prevent that clay from uh, drying out and creating a crust. We always want to keep a nice covering of mulch on top of that hard crummy soil so that it doesn't um, get hard again. And then when it does water, the water actually will percolate into that soil as opposed to running off. Over time, every time we plant new plants, we're going to amend the soil with some um, compost. And seasonally, if, is, uh, if it is an area of fruit trees or uh, perennials that are not natives, um, planting beds that are not natives, then I will move that mulch to the side. I will add compost around the drip line of the plants. I will put that mulch back on top. If I do this every fall before the winter season, again, over time, as that compost uh, kind of um, the microbiology kind of integrates that compost in the soil, it's going to continue to improve that structure. So how long will it take for crummy, hard, horrible clay to be beautiful and rich? It could take a while, but that's why we're using these tools. And then when I mentioned before, if there's an area of your garden that just is impossible, go ahead and apply uh, that um, practice of sheet mulching with the cardboard, multiple layers of cardboard with a lot of mulch on top. And if you can uh, ap apply one inch of compost and then layers of cardboard, and then four to six inches of mulch on top of that, that's really going to do the trick. And over about a year to two years, you're going to have an area that's going to be way more workable. Good question. It's not easy. Okay. 
All righty, so let's keep moving forward. So let's talk about the pest problems. So ants uh, start to come into the home this time of year, but understand outside in the garden, they are decomposers, they aerate the soil, they eat other insect pests, so they're kind of beneficial. However, they do like to farm that honeydew that like aphids and scale insect and thrip insect kind of secrete. So that's why you'll oftentimes see uh, ants trailing up into a tree or, you know, such as a citrus or fruit tree or trailing up into um, like a butylon or a um, hibiscus, things like that. And when I see that, I know that that's actually telling me that I've got another problem. I've got scale or I've got uh, aphids in that plant. So I'm going to want to manage that uh, scale or the aphids or that insect that's there and make sure that I've blasted them off with water or use insecticidal soap or neem and then manage the ants with a band of uh, like sticky insect um, glue such as the um, Tanglefoot or uh, the BioCare um, insect glue is also available on the market these days. Making sure we always put that sticky banding material on something that we can then remove later, such as packing tape sticky side out or thick uh, um, paper bag material. And then outside we can also uh, use different types of baits, such as the spinosad by um, Monterey, which is the ant control here, or we can use those uh, boric acid uh, sugar liquid baits. So Taro makes some that is actually a sugar bait with a boric acid as the active. However, if we are using these baits outside, we it, it's advised that we um, apply them in a way that other critters can't get to them. Now, though we know that um, the Monterey um, like this ant control is not going to be, we're not applying so much that it would be lethal to our pets. We just also don't want to invite that. And if our pets do happen to consume it, we want to take those pets to the vet and let them know that they did consume some of this. But this product is not a, a toxic product for our pets. However, if they've ingested more than what's reasonable, it could give them a tummy trouble. Uh, same with the boric acid. We want to make sure with those bait stations outdoors, I've learned just to get a gopher basket or some type of a wire mesh uh, covering that I have made to put over the basket, uh, the bait station and I've anchored it in with some type of landscape pins. And this will prevent an urban critter from coming and chewing on it. Indoors, when we see those scouts, uh, you know, checking out the scene. We want to clean them up. We want to uh, clean up those scent trails with soapy water. That's all we need to do. We're going to see if we can identify where the point of entry is. We're going to seal that up with a uh, fresh beat up caulk or something to uh, plug those cracks and crevices. And again, new weather stripping on the doors and windows really makes a difference. And then working with the bait stations. And as we all mentioned, yes, the bait stations are more effective. However, if you do need to use a spray, so sometimes I'll use a spray actually as a perimeter spray, uh, as a preventative and uh, products like Orange Guard where the active ingredient is just the oils of a citrus rind work really well. And then we've got products such as the boric acid in a powder, as opposed to the liquid, or diatomaceous earth in the powder. And uh, these are common products that we see in the aisle, and these are common products that people ask me about. So I just like to point out that the way the boric acid powder works, it's about the size of a grain of salt. And uh, the crawling insects, you know, we just do a light dusting of it. The crawling insects walk over it, such as ants and cockroaches. They groom themselves. That's how they ingest it. And uh, it disrupts their stomach enzymes. And that's how they die. Uh, and then the diatomaceous earth is a very, very fine chalk. It's just crushed diatoms. It's not toxic at all. However, because it's a fine dust, we don't want to breathe it. We don't want to get it in our eyes. Uh, but the way it works, it gets on the exoskeleton of the insect or their skin, so to speak and it dehydrates them. 
Both of these products, when used inside, we just want to make sure that they are not uh, accessible to our pets, to our children. So we want to make sure that they are uh, getting um, applied in a way that, you know, our pets and children cannot access them. And then here we are with sticky traps. Sticky traps are going to help uh, and help us identify where the problem is where the populations of these insects are, or um, if we have, uh, if, if we still need to take action, if we still have the problem, we're gonna use them as monitoring devices. When it comes to rodents, which happens to be the number one pest problem that I am talking about all the time. I talk about uh, rats and mice every single day. Isn't that fun? Uh, we, around our home, we want to walk the perimeter of our house. We wanna prune away any uh, shrubs, any perennials, any branches that might be hanging over the uh, rooftops. Understand the rats can jump three feet. So we want to kind of clear those areas to prevent them from accessing our house. If there is a, uh, any little hole, I've seen this before, where the house meets the foundation. Sometimes they'll nibble a little hole as their point of entry. And you see here, I'm holding this number two pencil. This number two pencil is three eighths of an inch. A mouse or a young rat can fit through this, the diameter of this hole. So that's why we work with quarter inch hardware cloth, because they can't fit through that, but they can fit through three-eighths, but not a quarter. So we're going to walk around our house and we're going to uh, remove the foundation vent, remove the attic vent, put that hardware cloth behind. If we're in a fire prone area, it's recommended by Cal Fire that you use eighth inch hardware cloth because eighth inch will also prevent embers from coming into the house. So now we're preventing rodents and embers. But then when we've got our chimney flue or we've got our dryer vent, that quarter inch hardware cloth is just fine. Um, and then we want to uh, move any type of pet food that they might be getting into in, and, and store it into those galvanized garbage cans, keeping the pets out. When we work with traps, we want to understand that rodents are suspicious of new things. So uh, when we have our traps, what we want to do is actually bait the traps before we set them, uh, get them really used to feeding off of those traps. The way we would uh, set the electronic traps is we just don't put the batteries in. And then that Tomcat kind of like Jaws style, uh, there's a way to actually have the bucket uh, that we put the food in. Uh, to move it to the front. Uh, look at the brand, they might all be a little different, uh, but there is a way to actually bait it without setting it. And then of course the Victor, uh, those uh, the traditional traps, those wooden ones, we just don't set it. A couple different traps to keep, uh, baits to keep in mind is of course you could try peanut butter. If we do use peanut butter, just to use a tiny little bit, but I'm a fan of working with a chewy granola bar or something similar to a Fig Newton or, you know, bait the traps with food they're already going for. So if they're already getting into that kitty kibble or that dog kibble, then bait the traps with that. Um, and then as soon as we have them comfortably feeding off those traps after about four or five times, then we're going to set that trap. And um, once we set that trap, we're going to monitor that trap and we're going to uh, remove the death as soon as possible, get it into a sealed bag and put that in the garbage. Outside, rats around the garden. Uh, this one's a little trickier, but we want to remove any, you know, potential places of harborage. We want to remove those IAV, those banks of IAV or other ground, ground covers whenever possible. We want to make sure our compost systems, if we're composting at home, that they are sealed and secure and they are lined with that quarter inch hardware cloth, floor, sides, and uh, top, the lid. Uh, same with our chicken coops. We want to make sure the chicken coops are Fort Knox, you know, making sure that the rodents cannot get into those coops to access the feed. We want to keep the lids on the garbage cans. We want to uh, reduce pet food availability. And what this means is some people just put that kibble out all day long for their animals that are outside just to kind of graze. Well, it's also an invitation for the rodents. So what I know and what I've been advised to share is that our cats and our dogs are really smart. 
And if they know they're only going to get fed from, you know, um, 10 to 11 a.m., they're going to be, they're going to make sure that they're there or even narrow up that, narrow up that window to make it just from 10 to 1030, for instance, you know, and over time, they're going to know to come running when you step out with that little bowl of food. And then we're going to remove that food after they've eaten and brought it back inside. We're going to rethink bird feeders. Again, that bird feeder, that seed is dropping food for our rodents. And whenever possible, we just want to remove access to their food sources. This is uh, common winter damage that the rodents do. Uh, it's very common that they will chew the bark off of trees, specifically citrus trees. So whenever possible, as we move to the winter months, let's put up a barrier. Let's wrap that uh, tree trunk with quarter inch hardware cloth or something similar to prevent them from uh, gaining access to that bark. And again, working with exclusion baskets and cages whenever possible, okay? Because the rodents really like their high nutrition and they will come in and they could just graze and annihilate an entire bed of kale in one night. And they do, I've seen it, it's crazy. So when we can have that uh, a frame over that food, then it prevents them from accessing it. And then of course, as I mentioned before, is with gophers, we're going to line raised beds with the half inch hardware cloth. We're going to plant all of our plants in gopher baskets. And then we're going to identify uh, what gopher activity looks like because it's a little different than mole activity. And we can certainly, again, similar to wrote the rats and mice, working with traps is going to be the most effective way to manage these populations. And for more support with uh, working with traps, you can go to the UCIPM website and search gophers. There you'll have, uh, uh, it's a two page write up on um, gopher management, as well as links to some videos on YouTube that talk about how to identify the active tunnel and how to set different types of gopher traps. So moles and bulls, as I mentioned, are going to look a little different than gophers. So identifying what the pest is will help with management practices. And from there, uh, we can work with repellents, understand that moles are actually eating the bugs in the soil that would then, it's the larva stage of these pest insects that would then later emerge as problems for us. So I see the moles as doing us a favor. They're beneficial in my eyes. However, they can kind of cause a lot of problems in a lawn. They can make it look really crummy pretty fast. Although when they've made their tunnel, really just raking that soil out is going to uh, be uh, as much as uh, I need to do to resolve the problem. But if it's a problem that's really persisting and has met a threshold that is um, not right, uh, then we can work with repellents. And the repellents that work really well are the repellents that have castor oil as an active ingredient. The castor oil uh, uh, will seep into the top, uh, let's say six inches of the soil, and it is going to act as a very effective repellent for the moles. Uh, it also prevent, is a, a repellent for gophers and voles as well. Uh, voles, if we happen to see their perfectly round tunnels on our property and we have a, a year of significant vole activity, then just putting those little wooden Victor uh, my, mouse traps, uh, just set it, doesn't need to be baited, just right in front, and that usually does the trick. And for squirrels, raccoons, and other urban critters, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. But again, we want to remove their food sources. We want to um, uh, avoid or limit feeding the feral cats and our pets outside, just like the, you know, it attracts rats. It's also going to attract the raccoons. Um, we want to use exclusion whenever possible. So those same um, points that we'd go through with the rats, making sure the garbages are secure, making sure that pet door that's coming in and out is secure at night because the raccoons have learned to come right into the house and get into the kitchen cabinets. I've seen it, it's crazy. And then the repellents that I know for urban critters are not as effective. However, if, um, 
the only, let me just rephrase that. The only repellent that I know over all the years of working in retail nursery management, working with consumers is the Critter Ritter will offer some support, some repelling properties. It is not going to be 100% effective. It is going to offer some repelling um, properties. It's not going to be long-term. Uh, it's not going to be sustainable, but for that season, sometimes just applying the um, repellent could help. If a raccoon is getting into our gardens and rolling up lawns to get the grubs, we could put down poultry wire, lay down a blanket of poultry wire or bird netting and anchor it down with landscape pins. That's a barrier that's going to prevent the raccoons. So think about different ways that we can prevent these pests by working with barriers uh, and exclusion, things like that. So for the um, pests that you've all been waiting for, slugs and snails, because yes, once we get these cool, moist days and once the rains come, the snails and slugs really take off. Um, understand that they uh, do not like the heat of the day, so they're going to be uh, crawling under looking for shelter. And that crawling under could be inside plant material, it could be underneath the lip of the raised bed, it could be underneath the um, pots, or the saucers, or um, underneath the deck, underneath a uh, planter, things like that. So keep that in mind when we're on the hunt. And what I like to suggest is at night, I'll go out uh, or early in the morning with a little bucket of soapy water with my gloves on, and I will just hand pick those slugs and snails off and just drop them in that soapy water or I'll feed them to the chickens. Uh, something else that's kind of cool is using snail boards, which is a wooden board that is lifted on like one by one risers and or one by two risers. And the slugs and snails will go under there to get shade from the heat of the day. And we lift that board up and we literally could just scrape uh, slugs and snails into that uh, soapy water. It's kind of gross. But the uh, if we want to use a, a pesticide, you know, the best ones on the market are those with the active ingredient iron phosphate, such as the sluggo and um, the natria. Um, and I think Bonide makes one and um, there's a couple brands out there. So make sure we look for the active ingredient that's iron phosphate. This is a, a product that is not gonna to be toxic to our pets or wildlife, but it is very effective in killing slugs and snails. So that is going to be what I recommend. If we need to uh, manage our irrigation systems, please water early in the day so that uh, the, the water can dry out and prevent uh, um, in the invitation for those slugs and snails. And when we use a chunky mulch around the property, like an arbor mulch or bark chips that are bigger, uh, understand that slugs and snails can't cross it. So it acts as a barrier. So um, copper tape also is gonna work on uh, the sleeves that go around our veggie starts or on our uh, raised beds or on our, our pots. So those are all the tips that I use when working with um, slugs and snails to prevent them. So um, in close, just I want to go back to the Our Water Our World website, which is so fantastic because on that website, there's fact sheets. There's one that uh, addresses slugs and snails. So I invite you to check it out. There's another one that talks about uh, rats and mice in the gar uh, around the home. There's one that talks about keeping ants out. So I invite you to go to the Our Water Our World website, check it out, uh, reference some of these fact she sheets that will offer uh, more support beyond what we just discussed today. There's also that list of less toxic products that gets updated every year. Um, and there's a handout that will um, introduce you to the 10 most wanted insects that good bugs that we're gonna see in the garden. Um, and then of course that ask the expert feature. So in close, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention, for sticking around, for asking all those great questions. And I'm happy to take any more questions if you have them right now. Thank you so much. If you have any questions uh, that come up later, feel free to reach out to me. Again, I'm Suzanne Bontempo, Program Manager for Our Water, Our World. You can find me at my website, which is plantharmony.org, 
or Suzanne at plantharmony.org. You can email me, ask me questions. You can sign up for my newsletter where I'm talking about uh, uh, pest tips, seasonal, seasonally relevant pest prevention and management tips. Julie, do we have any questions? We just got one new one. Let me take a look here. Awesome. Oh, Miss Campbell says, thank you. It was awesome. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for joining. I really appreciate that. Otherwise, I think we've got it. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you all have a nice evening. Take good care and hope to see you again soon. At the next program that we might be hosting. So check it out. You can always go to my website and see what upcoming events, uh, more classes that I'll be teaching uh, for free throughout the seasons because the topics do change. So thanks so much. Have a great afternoon and take good care.